ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Computer Science, we extend a warm welcome to all the dignitaries, guests, and students present here at the present Alihani workshop on medical image understanding. Experts from national and international organizations will lead the sessions to form a network of researchers to collaborate and advance the research and development in the field. Today marks the support successful day of the event, and we are thrilled to have you all join us today. I am Dana, and along with my friend Vaishnavi, we will be hosting today's event, and together we will be guiding you through today's exciting program. Before starting today's event, I request everyone to raise for the silent prayer. Good morning to all. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to Dr. Madhu and Dr. Santosh for inviting me. This is my second time in Kochi University. First time was all I think by the electronics department some of several years back. And they were, there was a group interested in signal processing and uh, there was a man in chief. So uh, I'm, uh, I just uh, wanted to tell you that my interest in uh, medical imaging and processing started long time back and here is one of my collaborators, Dr. Joseph. So I have a lot of collaborators and that is what I am going to discuss today. Uh, how medical field or radiologists or any other surgeons can collaborate with uh, medical imaging specialists and come out with products which are very useful for actually the diagnosis of, uh, and treatment of patients. So why I got interested is one of the main reasons is because I joined this institute, which is the Sri Chitra Institute of Medical Sciences. Some of you might be knowing about this institute. This is an institute under the Department of Science and Technology Government of India. And the institute was mainly created to develop biomedical devices. So we have a hospital and that, that, that is the hospital 
the hospital is mainly looking after cardiological sciences and neurological sciences only no other part uh, is looked into and we have this biomedical technology wing which was handed over this is like looking like a palace by the then Trabco Maharaja and that is why the institute is called Sri Chitra Dhinna, uh, Institute of Medical Sciences because that uh, Maharaja gave that land as well as that palace for this sort of uh, work, biomedical device development. So this is a place where scientists and engineers can work. And this is the public health wing of the institute, Achyutamanyan Center. Achyutamanyan are a former chief minister's name. So in his name, this is the Achyutamanyan Center. So we have these three wings. Public health is there. You have a biomedical technology development and the hospital, which looks into cardiology and neurology. Okay, so most of my work has been mainly neuro, neurosciences, neuroradiology uh, is the department where I work. And in neuroradiology, as you know, that over the years, when I did my post graduation in radiology, that time MRI was not there. So that is in, uh, in the 90s, early 90s, the Kerala did not have an MRI. You can imagine that clear. It is just 25 years now. You have so many MRIs in the state, so many CT scan and that too, multi slice CT scan, ultrasound and what not, infrared spectroscopy, so many imaging techniques are available. And why do you need these imaging equipments when you go to a, uh, uh, as a patient or just as a common person to see whether there is a problem in your brain? because you have frequent headaches. The doctor there, we, who is looking at it, looks at two things. One is the structural aspect, whether in the structure there is any problem. For the structural aspect, we look at the anatomy, the anatomy in the brain. So there are different parts of the brain. You have the frontal region, the occipital region, you would have learned it. Of course, as engineering students, you would have never forgotten the term medulla oblongata. At least that you will remember, if not after the other things. So these things, we learn, we look at each of these structures, find out whether there is a problem in this. That is looking at the anatomy, anatomy, which gives an information whether there is a structural problem in the brain. There could be a bleed. There could be an area where blood circulation has normally not been there. So we find out that area. But that is only one part of uh, neuroimaging. The other part is the functional neuroimaging. Because you know every structure, whether it is liver, heart, the brain, has an important function. And you also need to understand the function of the brain. Because the function will be defective, but you might not see anything in the brain. I will tell you a common example. There are so many children with learning disabilities. Uh, autism is one of them, uh, or some other uh, learning disability might be there. In such cases, when you do the MRI, MRI will be perfectly normal. The structural part will be perfectly normal. But they will have functional some changes, which is different from the normal population. So that functional aspects can also be today's study. So the structural aspects are usually studied by MRI or CT scan, while the functional aspect is studied by techniques like positron emission tomography or functional near infrared spectroscopy or functional MRI. So there are, and then even in CT scan there are some functional techniques which I will discuss with you. So there are a lot of these functional techniques. So both structural and functional information is what you are looking for. And then, then the what, what does the doctor do? The doctor, uh, this is a CT scan image of a person who was riding a bike suddenly had an accident and then came to us. And you can see that in the CT scan there is some abnormality. If you would have seen the CT of a normal person, you would definitely see there is some problem in the uh, brain. Yeah, there is a problem. What is the problem? There is some bright area here. So this bright area is actually blood. But uh, why, how did you say that it is blood? Because in CT scan and in MRI, there is these signals are there. This signal is what we are analyzing by our 
knowledge that if this particular signal is there, that is if it is bright, the bright area in the CT scan indicates certain things like it, it can indicate black, it can indicate gold, it can indicate calcification. So there are certain things and that it can be measured also and that is called the Hounsfield unit. Hounsfield is the person uh, who discovered CT scan and was later on got the Nobel Prize also. So, so this, the, with the Hounsfield units you can measure, even without that, even by looking you can say that this is bright. But this is area is also bright and this area is also bright. So, is there bright there? There also you could, could ask that question. <coughs> but then what I do is, I have my pointer placed on this structure and look at the Hounsfield units there and find it, it is near 100. And when I put it here, it is only 60. Then I understand that this is bright. And this is 100. That is because the attenuation, the, it is basically an X-ray technique. The attenuation of each of these elements, uh, the hemoglobin containing blood versus calcification is different. And you will be able to differentiate these things. Similarly, I see an area which is very black. The black area, if I put the pointer, it will be something near zero. It is water. So I know it is water. So what I am able to do, very important thing in MRI or CT scan, here in the CT scan, what did I do? I did something called the tissue characterization. What is the structure? What is the substance? I am trying to tell you that. Whether it is calcification or, but then you can ask the question, then can you differentiate between copper, uh, iron and all, you are able to tell calcium? No, it is not possible. It might not be possible. But there are other techniques coming in MRI by which you might be able to differentiate even structures like that. But it is far away, it is the way things are going in that sort. And then there is uh, newer techniques, quantum counting, CT scan, photo, uh, and various techniques are coming. Even in CT scan, you should, uh, you might be able to after some time tell many of these things. So the progress in these areas are going on so that you can better characterize the tissue. Now why do you want to characterize the tissue? Because you need to know the pathology. So you look at the anatomy which I showed, told you earlier. So you look where, where it is. So here I am telling that it is in the temporal lobe. This is an area of the brain somewhere here. So I, so that is, that is the where aspect of it. You have to tell which is important because any structure, whether you, if it is a liver tumor, you should say it is in the right side, left side, which are the artery, which is the vein, which are the blood vessels going close to it, all these things you have to tell. That is all anatomy. And this is pathology. What is pathology? Pathology is telling what is the disease. So now you learn three terms in medicine. One is anatomy, another is uh, the uh, function and the third functional and the third one here is pathology. Pathology is the disease. What sort of a disease is it? So by looking at the elite, I could say it is blood, blood in the brain. So that is the pathology. Some because of the accident, he has developed blood in the brain. So mainly doctors are looking for the anatomy and pathology in the brain. I, I, I know I am going very basic so that I am talking from the doctor's viewpoint so that those students who are here might be able to understand that what a radiologist actually does. Now he gets an image when uh, in 80s uh, when we were uh, doing radiology residency that means post graduation. At that point there were no digital images for looking. All were ana analog images. The the photos that uh, old photos you would have seen in the wedding albums and all that sort of. There was no digital image at that time. It happened later on. Uh, in CT scan and MRI, we started getting uh, digital images. Now, for X rays also, we have digital images. And then you get a lot of these uh, numbers. Each pixel uh, has a particular uh, number there. Now, what are the things that you are looking for? The spatial resolution, the temporal resolution, the contrast resolution, signal to noise ratio. This is what is important for the radiologists. And we have technologies who know how to do the imaging and their responsibility along with the responsibility of the radiologist is to get an image with a good spatial resolution, temporal contrast and signal to the The problem is you will not get all these things together. 
Now, what is spatial resolution? Spatial resolution is in this particular image how close to uh, you have seen it 24, 31. Uh, so, how closely uh, placed objects you can visualize nicely is what spatial resolution means. So, very close object you should be able to visualize in a good way. Usually, it gets blurred. But if it is uh, the spatial resolution is very high, you will be able to differentiate these points. In temporal resolution, you are looking at the time, how fast you can image. Can you tell a structure which needs a very fast temporal resolution to image in the body? One structure. You have to have a very fast scanning for that. These are structures which move. Hard. Heart. So you have to have a very good temporal. Suppose you want to see the blood vessel in the heart. The blood vessel is also moving with the heart. And that is where you are having narrowing. And when you have narrowing, you have a heart attack. But you have to find out where the narrowing is so that you can feel that. You can open up that. Angioplasty, coronary stenting, uh, and all is done. Based on that an, uh, image that you get. So, for that, you should have a good temporal resolution. So, your imaging technique should have a good temporal resolution. Contrast resolution, how good you can differentiate the various gray scales as what is you see in the contrast resolution. And signal to noise ratio, I am sure most of you know better than me how, what, what are the things that you have to look for. Now, there, if you look at this brain imaging techniques, uh, you can see that here it is the time which is written and here it is the, the, the distance between two uh, uh, points. If you look at that, there are certain imaging techniques which have a good temporal resolution but a spatial resolution is poor. Uh, there are some other techniques where the spatial resolution might be very good but the temporal resolution is poor. So that is what is shown here. But for us, for a radiologist, we would be happy if we can go get both the temporal resolution as well as the spatial resolution good. Also, you, the time of the whole imaging technique is also important. So, suppose you are uh, uh, doing in a uh, uh, scan of a patient with stroke and you have to map, de uh, decide when your management has to start. It has to be done. The, the technique that you have to be done should be very, very fast. Or the post-processing that you, have, you are going to do should be fast so that you get the result. So that further management is decided. So the time there is very important. See, at the same time you have a very good uh, fast technique but if the image quality, if it is very bad, then you cannot interpret it. You are, so I hope you understood. So I would like, as a doctor, a radiologist, I would like to get a technique which runs very fast, but then the, uh, the quality of the image should be interpretable. You, I should be able to say what the problem is looking at the image. So there is trade-offs. This is what I wanted to trade. This trade-off is where you can come in. For example, there is a trade-off with spatial resolution in the SNR. So whenever you do an MRI, you go on Looking at the SNR, trying to improve the SNR, you will see the spatial resolution goes off. The trade off between a master scanning technique and artifacts. So, suppose uh, there is a technique in MRI called a spin echo imaging, then there is the gradient imaging techniques, echo planar imaging. I use the echo planar imaging technique, the problem will be it is fast, but the quality of image won't be very good. Interpreting it, it might be uh, a problem. So, there is again a trade off between this. Uh, again, in parallel assistive techniques or Then, even uh, post processing techniques, when you make it very fast, uh, we have seen that very fast, how some of the post processing techniques results might be very fast, but the uh, accuracy of the results might not be good. So, remember these trade offs are there, and these trade offs are where we are playing, uh, playing with. The whole uh, image processing with these digital images started with reconstructed uh, techniques and these are the various reconstructed techniques we very frequently use in MRI which is maximum or minimum intensity production, shaded surfaces, 
So you can get these axial images of the CT scan or the MRI and then you reconstruct it. You have, I reconstruct this for example it is the abdominal scan done and then the reconstruction which is called the maximum intensity projection is done. Contrast has been injected, contrast in IOD has been injected into the body and then you have captured a lot of images and from these images you have made uh, maximum intensity projection of uh, aneurysm. Aneurysm is the blood vessel has become very balloon like. Here this is within the brain. The blood vessel has become balloon like. So this is all by reconstructing techniques you are able to visualize it. This tumor looking like this would uh, give the surgeon a very good uh, method to understand how he should approach that particular tumor. So what I wanted to tell is these techniques are done for better interpretation. This is uh, this is not what we, when we acquire we get these images and then we uh, take it for various post processing techniques which are mentioned below and then you get these sort of images. These are the various post processing techniques. The other point is I told you about structural imaging, I told you about functional imaging. Now can we join structural and functional imaging together? Naturally it would be better if we can put both information together rather than today you go for an MRI scan and you have a headache, you go for an MRI scan naturally what the doctor there is going to do is just a structural scan. But is there a functional information also you can obtain? Yes you can. For that there are techniques again by post processing techniques by which you can co-register this data. This is just co-registration. Here what has been done is PET has been done for this uh, patient and in PET uh, the, your, one of the resolution is bad. That is the spatial resolution is bad. And you don't uh, really know from where these functional changes are occurring in the brain. But MRI has a good spatial resolution. So functional information from PET is taken and you put that on the structural images of MRI. By doing that, you get the functional information, your spatial resolution becomes better and you know where the problem inside the brain is. So these are the various techniques that you can do to get more information from your images. You combine two techniques. You can combine EEG and functional MRI. Why do you want to do? Suppose a patient is having fits. Epilepsy, that is what it is called, fits. And from where it is coming, you want to know. EEG causes many changes in the brain. Functional MRI is a technique which also picks up changes in the brain. But EEG gives the electrical activity. FMRI gives the changes which happen in the brain after the electrical activity, the blood changes which happen. So both are different part of the physiology. Both are different part of the function in the brain. One is the electrical activity in the brain and in the functional MRI, what are the blood changes which has happened because of this electrical activity that is captured. If you can put them together, probably you would be able to tell from where in the brain is this seizure coming, is this fits coming, so that you can operate that particular area and completely remove it. So these are, these are all techniques which are done to better understand the disease by imaging methods. This is, for example, this is, this is not a problem. Uh, why I am showing all these things is these are all problems that you face. So when you take EEG and fMRI, and I think Joseph has worked in this area, is it? Uh, you, you work, he was in UK. When he, I, I have also gone to the same lab uh, where he was. So, so the problem there is when they started doing this particular uh, the thing was you have uh, background what you see here is the EEG signals. But you see, the whole thing is because of artifacts produced by the MR. So you have to remove this artifacts, scanner artifacts. So that was a problem uh, in processing and that was done. So these are the various problems that you have to So that was the part one of my talk where I described about the various techniques that we usually do. Should I keep the questions to the end or? Do you want to ask any questions at this point of time? Two, two, two. So, 
So that, that is what the radiologist does. I, I, I am a radiologist and a radiology technologist together, gets the images, does the post-processing, gives the information to the patient. And what is the information? You have now asked. Now there is a big trend, big, a change which is happening that is from qualitative imaging techniques to a quantitative imaging techniques. Why is quantitative imaging techniques important? When you uh, have diabetes, you get a blood sugar level and looking at the blood sugar level, you say that your this thing is slightly on the higher side, there is a huge increase that is told because of that value. So suppose it is 500. Then you say it is very high. Then you, suppose it is just 180 or 150, you say it's mild increases there. It is quantitative. These quantitative techniques are were used very less in medical imaging. Most of the imaging was qualitative. From very old days, when an X-ray of a patient with tuberculosis is there, you just see the image and you just used to say that there is a tuberculosis. But now more and more interest is uh, there to make it quantitative. And what is this quantitative image? From an image, you get a lot of information. You uh, get an information about the number. Suppose there is this is a particular disease called multiple sclerosis. And in a patient with multiple sclerosis, you have these white matter patches. You see these white matter patches? These are white matter patches inside the brain. Now, this patient is put on a treatment. And you want to see whether your treatment is getting effective or not. So there are two methods. You can just put the image and say that I, I looked at the image and I think the number of uh, these white matter patches that you see is coming down. But the, then uh, the patient can ask you, how, many, how much has it come down? Has it really come down? It has come down. That is how the radiologist usually say it. Is, the number is coming down, size is decreased. There is no quantitative aspect to it. But there is now more interest to make it more quantitative. So you can actually do a segmentation of each of these white matter patches, add all these together, and then find out what is the total amount of load. That is called the lesion load. It is called the lesion load in the so the lesion load has come down on treatment. How much it has come down? This sort of quantitative information now can be okay. So this is just one of the cases. This is the tumor again. You see, in tumor a lot of work has been done. By the way, the first work, which to some extent we have uh, done with NID calculate long time back. Uh, and now this, this particular one we are doing with this Vich uh, Pilani Hyderabad campus and that is segmentation of the brain uh, tumor. You take the brain tumor, there has been a huge amount of studies in this area. There are a lot of free software, so free data available on the website. You can also work on it. BRATS is one of the most well known uh, data. Uh, so, in a tumor, there are various structures. There is a structure which, as, as you can see here, this is enhancement, this is becoming brighter in contrast. There is some sort of resistive area, fluid area is there. So all these different areas are there. Solid area, fluid-like area is there. The enhancing area is there. And you, you need to understand how much of solid area is there, how much of uh, resistive area is there. Why it is important? Because when you start the patients on radiotherapy and your medicines, then sometimes the fluid areas will start increasing, the solid areas will start coming down. So you, you get an information. So for that, you have to segment. You segment the fault so, so liquid area separately, your solid area separately, enhancing area separately. All these things have to be separated. And then you have to tell that the solid enhancing area, which actually is the tumor, is actually coming down when you are treating this. So such informations are uh, all quantitative now. Slowly it is all quantitative rather than qualitative. This is one work which we have done is quantitative susceptibility management. These are all various techniques that I am describing. So before going into that, I, I just wanted to tell, in MRI, you are working with a lot of sequences. Spin echo sequence, gradient echo sequences, and you using the one particular sequence is called the susceptibility weighted sequence. In the susceptibility weighted sequence inside the brain, you uh, get information about ion deposition because as the brain degenerates, 
when it be becomes older or as a young you, it, there is a degenerating disease then more of iron starts depositing in the brain uh, and similarly when there is uh, blood yeah, in an elderly uh, person there can be areas of blood inside the brain all these things are much better detected on this technique called quantitative susceptibility mapping and quantitative susceptibility mapping the quantitative susceptibility mapping is a technique is a mapping technique by which you can actually tell how much of iron deposition is there you can even tell how much of this is iron how much of this is calcium because in quantitative susceptibility map you should you may be able to really tell between these elements all these things are possible this area is only developing some of the work i think again uh, joseph is doing some work on uh, quantitative susceptibility map again all these collaboration i have shown you some of oh, the other is fractal dimension in uh, prototypical dimension this was with uh, venkat who was abroad in us who has come back now got this plan uh hyderabad we think now we are doing on brain tumors but the work that we had done with him was on frontotemporal dementia so you know dementia is memory loss as the person ages alzheimer's disease i am sure you would have all heard about it in alzheimer's disease in frontotemporal dementia all these are different forms of brain diseases which result in memory loss but we want to know what it is because we know that if it is frontotemporal dementia then the care that the patient needs is different from an becoming smaller in size when the brain becomes smaller it is not the size alone which decreases there will be a, a shape differences so other than the size we are now looking at the shape by means of fractal dimension technique and we have uh, seen that some of the areas in the brain the the frontal the frontal lobe uh, there is a structural change and that is called the fractal dimension Yeah. Uh, how do you really calculate the areas in the brain which are getting reduced? You can look at the uh, the these are structures in the brain: the insula, the uh, then you have the frontal lobe. The this is the midbrain. Now you might be thinking, why I'm telling all these things to an engineering crowd? If you are going to do a project in this particular area, you actually need to learn some amount of these elements. otherwise it will become very difficult for because after some time as you know I, because i have been collaborating with several institutions what i have seen is the initial enthusiasm is there in collaborations the doctors will come up with some ideas and all then the phd student the research fellow starts working in that particular area the engineering student initially the the uh, guy from the medical side or the mentor from the medical side starts explaining gets started but later on many times the uh, doctor might not get the time to sit with you so it is always better to by looking at the various uh, information that you get from textbooks or from internet you learn that particular anatomy or diseases of that particular area uh, so that is important that is uh, then only you will be really able to really uh, go into the depth of the image processing part of it. so what i always tell people who take up uh, post processing or uh, some related uh, image processing uh, study you first understand about how the image acquisition happens suppose you are working on an mri image you should know how acquisition of mri images are being done the physics behind the mr the t1 the t2 all these things a basic idea you should have second if you are working on the brain you understand the brain is like how some understanding of the brain functioning brain anatomy this is also needed and then about the disease so physics anatomy and uh, pathology the disease you should know of if you are studying on liver some uh, disease better understand all these things otherwise what you will be doing something finally you will come up with some thing but it will not be useful for anybody and you might not be correct at all in what you have done so that is where the very frequent collaboration uh, very frequent discussions be between the clinicians the doctors and the engineers are needed in many of these projects 
This is on the segmentation of the various uh, structures again. Uh, you might want to be uh, insular, vegetative status, or various structures in the brain which are, uh, you are actually calculating by looking at this address, so normal address is made, and then you find out how much reduction of size has happened compared to a normal address. So, uh, there are techniques for uh, statistical environment mapping and all, where you can uh, do this. Voxel based complementary is another technique of volumetry. The various steps are there uh, which by which you can uh, calculate areas of the brain which is reducing size in Alzheimer's disease or photocatabolic dimension. Uh, some of the research work that we have done, uh, this, this was uh, the work which we uh, did with uh, for calculation of photocatabolic dementia. I was talking about uh, dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, photocatabolic dementia. And looking at how volume reduction is happening in certain areas of brain, and that is what uh, was the work in this. And then uh, we have brain segmentation, the brain tumor study, which I told you. This is a group in IIT Madras with which we collaborated. We segmented the brain, uh, the uh, various areas in the brain tumor, the area where there is more more fluid, more enhancing area. Solid area, where segmented. These are the various techniques which are used. You see, I don't understand anything about these techniques. What is the semi supervised? I just know very broad. But if you really ask me, this was an old, old study. This is uh, which is some, something which has come out now. So there are various methods which you can use, which you people can uh, do it. But when you do these uh, techniques, uh, uh, it is not just for image sharing that you have to collaborate with the uh, doctors. It is more than that. You have to actually sit together with them. You have to validate whatever results. You have to then go on asking the clinician whether what you are doing is are correct. And there, there have been instances where uh, I tell you the, the, uh, the work, the PhD student was working on something like a flare image. It was totally wrong. It was supposed to be working on T1 weighted images, but the person was he did not know the difference between a flare image and a T1 weighted image. Because he had not gone to basic of a MRI image at all. And then started working. So this is the problem. You have to actually understand all these images, sit with them and then only better work so that the results that you can get will be also much better. The the next point is uh, uh, the imaging technique has also improved. Now we, you have images by which the brain, uh, initially the brain was being cut only into about 21, 22 slices and you used to study that. But with an MRI, newer brain techniques have come by which you can get much more details of the anatomy. For example, this is, this is a tumor inside the brain. If you have would have just taken the 2D images, you would not have been able to tell where exactly the tumor is. But once you did the 3D images, which are very thin slices, you are actually able to tell where the tumor is and how is its relation to the nerves nearby and how the surgeon should approach it. So 3D te techniques are coming in more. We have techniques like MR spectroscopy, where we have another aspect in the brain that is the chemistry of the tumor or the normal structures. So in the brain there is neurons, so the neurons are n acetyl aspartate and n, uh, the quantity of this n acetyl aspartate, whether it is coming down or going up, can be found out. Similarly, there is choline inside the brain. The choline uh, increases when there is more membrane breakdown, when there is a tumor. So this information you can get by this technique of MR spectroscopy. This is the tumor and I understand by looking at this image is a mass spectroscopy, whether it's a tumor which is going to spread very fast or whether, whether it is a slowly going tumor. Then you have the functional information inside the brain, which is the perfusion imaging. One of the techniques is the perfusion imaging, where you get all these are maps, different maps. Now what is the difference between a map and an image? An image is when you, uh, when you do an MRI, you get it uh, different, you do different sequences and then you get a particular image in a T1 weighted or the image may be T2 weighted. But in a map, 
every area in the map is quantitative. You get an information about how much of increase of a perfusion has happened. So that is, these are all maps which you get. Uh, RCB, cerebral blood body map, cerebral blood flow map. This gives information about how much of an increase, uh, quantitative info information. So you bring quantitative information to your uh, normal sequences. Going to functional MRI, uh, I don't know how, how many of you have would have uh, seen or heard about this particular technique of functional MRI, where I told you that whenever there is an electrical activity in the brain, now I am talking. When I am talking, there is some areas in the brain where the activity is more. Which are the areas? One is the speech area, the other area is the memory area. So if I scan my brain now, the structural images will be same which would have been done when I was sitting in the train. There would have not have been any difference because the structure is going to be same. But in the train I was just sitting silently, nothing, not uh, just close to eyes or sleeping. So now, but now I am talking, so there, there are certain areas in the brain which are getting active, which includes the speech area, the memory area, because from the memory I have to be talking. So these areas, the blood is increased in that area. There is electrical activity coming in these areas and there is naturally the blood to that area increases and the blood that increases to that area can be captured by means of a technique called blood oxygen level dependent imaging technique and that is what is done in functional MRI so here the patient is uh, seeing some structure like this the checkerboard and activity in the brain is happening in the that this area is the active area that is uh, lighted up. That is what is called the functional MRI. Now, functional MRI is slightly different. When you go to a hospital here in Kochi and get an MRI done, usually they don't do functional MRI. Functional MRI is done for a particular reason. They do a routine MRI technique where you get the structural information only. But to understand the various uh, like language functions in the brain, you have to do the fMRI, functional MRI. Where the patient is shown certain things like checkerboard is shown or certain other or maybe sceneries are shown, some sentences are shown. And when these are shown, the patient actually, patient or the person who is lying down, uh, will be able, will be thinking and those areas where the blood circulation is increasing, that can be captured. Also, responses can be given. So this is an fMRI center, which is done in, not in all institutions. This is regularly done, especially in neuroscience centers. And then you get uh, information like this. For example, there is a tumor in this person, and the tumor has to be removed. Now, what the surgeon wants to know, the neurosurgeon wants to know, is how close to this tumor is the hand area. The hand area, I'm, if I move this hand, there is an activity happening in the brain. Where is the active area in the brain? Is what you are finding out by means of this fMRI technique. And I have done it. I have asked the patient to move both the hands. And at that point of time, I see that the tumor is here and the active hand area is close by. So the surgeon is going to know that you should not go too much behind. So that this area, otherwise, what would happen is if they go too much behind, after the surgery, the patient will not be able to move his hand. So that information you get with the fMRI study. So we regularly do this. This is not done in many centers. I have in Kochi, there are only one or two centers which just carry it also. So we have only few centers do this, but the advantage of this is you are actually telling the patient beforehand, before the surgery, that we may not be able to completely remove this tumor because if you remove them, you will have weakness. So the rest of the things we will do by radiation. So these are the functional information that we are trying to get. And this was done actually a research study with the institution in Hyderabad where, where we were looking at how depressed persons versus normal people do neuroeconomics. Have you heard about neuroeconomics? Neuroeconomics is a branch where uh, you, your selection process is identified. How you go to, a, for example, you go to a supermarket. There are different types of uh, soaps there. You are selecting one type of soap. 
and or the, in the stock market you are uh, selecting one particular company stock. How do you do select these things? Which areas in the brain gets activated? Is it normal in a person who is having depression versus a person who is normal, so called normal? Uh, and you, we saw that those who are depressed they make a lot of mistakes. They because their mind is not focused, they make mistakes while choosing and that difference we could understand. So these are the sort of functional MRI studies. Why I showed you two cases? One is clinical study. The earlier one I showed is for patient management. And this is not at all a clinical study, it's a research study. And if you see the literature of functional MRI, huge amount of such studies have been done. How does meditation affect your brain? Uh, all these things have been studied or uh, say uh, your attitude, whether you are telling a lie or not, all these things have been studied. Uh, I don't want to go into because, uh, details of that because the studies that we have done on this research side on functional MRI is relatively really less and we have concentrated more on the clinical aspects. And now the uh, issue of fMRI was always that you had to have that particular all those uh, paraphernalia for doing it and it could not be done in all the place. Then they need this particular technique of rusting state fMRI. And uh, the rusting state fMRI was first paper of rusting state fMRI came from an Indian guy working in US. He might get a Nobel after some time. So uh, his name is Bharat Viswa. That was the first paper on a uh, proceedings of Natural Academy of Sciences. Uh, it came, PNAS. And actually, what uh, the resting state fMRI does is even when you are not active, when you are not doing any particular function, even at that time, there are these blood oxygen level dependent changes which is happening in the brain, and if you can capture that. So, uh, why, how it is important for me as a radiologist is suppose a patient with epilepsy is coming, fits is coming, and I want to operate that uh, person, and I want to tell where the language area is. These uh, children may not cooperate for the function that I uh, tell the patient to do, but if they are just asked to lie down, in the resting state also you can get this information. That is resting state of MRI. Now are you doing it? The next question you can ask me. No, I am not doing it. I am not doing it regularly because I don't have engineers with me. I do not know about all these things. You know, graph theory, independent component analysis, dynamic castle model. There is a huge role, that is where what, what I wanted to tell you. Many of these technologies are available, but we are not using it. I am very sure that Rahul, you are here you, uh, in Norway or in the West. There are so many HTS which are sitting very close to doctors and you apply all these things. We are not able to do it because if you see a hospital, you go to a hospital, can you even imagine the engineers with some four or five people sitting and telling all this. No, it is not there. We have never had that sort of a working together. The culture is not there. We have a biomedical technology. We have a hospital. But I think that we need more people collaborating. We should, the engineers should, and scientists should more frequently come and sit together so that we will be doing this more, this all these things. This is, no, most of the work that we did was part of some PhD thesis or a project and it stops at that point. We have not been able to take it into clinics because there is nobody who knows this and regularly does all these things. Otherwise we could have done a resting state from our own language and try to uh, find out whether language localization is done, uh, done, can be done by just uh, just the patient doing the resting state rather than uh, activity state. So there are a lot of things which uh, needs collaboration. The diffusion tensor imaging is another, just like a functional MRI, needs a lot of post-processing to get very good images uh, where uh, you track the white matter tracks in the brain, uh, the, not the, uh, the cortical areas like the language area, I told you, hospital area. Here we are looking at the white matter connections between Two areas, so suppose I am talking, the, the, when I am talking, the memory area is active, the speech area is active. The first area which might be getting active is the memory area. From there, a wire has to go to the speech area. 
and then this, from the speech area, a lot of impulses has to go to the tongue and all so that I can start talking to you. So there is a huge complex process which is happening. And there are a lot of wires which are connecting these areas and these can be visualized by means of the uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, and uh, the, in the diffusion tensor imaging also, uh, we have worked on, on this particular condition called frontotemporal uh, dimension. This is the work I did with Joseph. Uh, uh, the work where we were trying to look at the susceptibility variable imaging, uh, which I told you, which is good for detecting iron, calcification, blood, but whether we can increase the quality, the SLR of these images is, and the contrast noise ratio is what we were trying to do, and uh, I think Joseph will be able to explain these various techniques of HHP, WHP, WHPC, and all of it. I do not know. But I will just be able to tell these images better. Diagnostic quality is better and how this can be utilized uh, in a clinical setting. And this was the work which we did with, uh, with Sudhi, uh, Calicate uh, NIT, where uh, he was trying to get the images, MR images, and the denoising of these images because a lot of artifacts were there, he was trying to remove these artifacts uh, by uh, uh, these techniques. This is again coming from the same group. This was one of the earliest work we did somewhere back in uh, 2000, uh, between 2000 and 2010. Uh, this, this particular technique was uh, worked with uh, Jenny. Jenny is, Jenny Raj is now a faculty at NIT Surat. The problem here was that patients uh, who have epilepsy seizures have this particular entity called optical dysplasia. Now it is very difficult to detect the particle species. You miss these species. Human eye many times misses these species. So our problem to Jay was, you see, this is a very difficult uh, problem to pick it up. But second is you pick it up and what you don't understand what is the real boundaries of it. If you don't understand the boundaries, the surgeon might not be able to complete the removal. So can you by some technique be able to find out uh, this uh, particle species? Of course, he started some work. There were a lot of false positives when he did that sort of work. He used some technique of uh, texture analysis, which was published also. But he continued his interest in that particular area. And after becoming a faculty, it was given to a PhD student as a project. Uh, first, uh, Vijay Dev, then Edwin Thomas. And they came up with base techniques by which you can take this particle situation. And we are only actually very few groups in the whole of the world working on particle dysplasia. There are groups in Canada, uh, in UK, which, is, which has been also published. But our, this, especially the second paper is cited quite frequently in picking up these particle uh, dysplasia. We have not been able to reach anywhere near actually picking up these particle dysplasia. They are very tough. But at least the segmentation of the particle dysplasia has been. These regions are quite difficult for segmentation also because it looks almost like brain. But there are some changes in the structure of the region, which features are there which could be picked up. And that is what he was working on. This is some of one earlier method that uh, machine learning, when we got interested in uh, machine learning spectroscopy, I told you about looking at the chemistry of brain tumors. Could you, by machine learning methods, Look at these various spectra that you get in brain tumors and say what, what are high grade tumors which are more malignant versus low grade which are more benign brain tumors. And some of these machine learning techniques were used. After that, several new papers have come with uh, several new methods also. This is a recent work which we learned with TKM Engineering College. Uh, Shaina is uh, the PhD student, is also a faculty here. So, the problem with the ASS, arterial spring labeling, is a perfusion imaging technique. Now, the problem with uh, arterial spring labeling is the images that you get are very poor quality images. And actually, if you put, they, it gives another information about the cerebral blood flow. So, you put a, uh, a point there, you can measure the cerebral blood flow. But the quality is very bad, a lot of artifacts. So she was working on various methods by which the
The architectural simulating method can be improved. There is already Stanford has worked in this area. A lot of publications have already come. I think she used some other methods also and uh, came out with a few other techniques. But I, I think the Stanford group's uh, technique has already been applied in MR machines. Some of the MR machines have already started using. Come, uh, differentiation between Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment, this again uh, was a work which was in-house work which we did with bio, our biomedical technology, various methods. What is mild cognitive impairment? Mind, before a person develops Alzheimer's disease, there is a period, some of the people have just mild cognitive impairment. Some of these people go in for Alzheimer's later on after a year or two or three, but the others don't go. So, can you differentiate these two by artificial neural networks? By looking at the images, can you classify which are the groups which are going to go for Alzheimer's, which are the ones which are not going to go for Alzheimer's? Why is it important? Because caregivers, information to caregivers, information to patients, relatives should be given. So a good classification system, if it can differentiate between mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, it is useful. Huge amount of work has been done in this area. Uh, machine learning techniques and not the other techniques also, like uh, diffusion tensor imaging, check, functional MRI, resting state of MRI, all these techniques have been done. And you have Mahesh yesterday, Mahesh was here. This is uh, the work of Mahesh during the COVID 19, collaboration with IIT Palaka. Uh, my uh, Lung Ultrasound is a work in which you know, during the COVID period, it was not very easy for doctors to go near the patient very frequently, or the nurses to go near the patient. So the main uh, this thing was to find out methods by which uh, you can understand the lung ultrasound, get some of the features in COVID-19, and if you get these features, can you differentiate between a COVID-19 person versus uh, the other group, which is not having covid so are there any features very particular in lab ultrasound? And most of the data actually we got from Italy because during not from Italy, Spain. During the, the those times, Spain had a very large number of uh, these cases. In India, actually the number of centers which just as lab ultrasound is relatively less. It is just getting more and more people are getting trained in it, and we will have more data from here also. So this is the work uh, which we did with that. And uh, other than the MRI and the CT scan, we have also worked on functional near infrared spectroscopy. And uh, the signals that we get from functional uh, near infrared sp uh, spectroscopy for classification, this is almost a similar, similar uh, principle of functional MRI, where you are looking at the red oxygen level. And in, by means of near infrared spectroscopy, you are able to differentiate which are the areas getting more activated. And why this is important? Because fMRI, as you know, is a large MRI machine. And suppose you want to do the uh, it daily for a patient, it is not almost possible. But suppose you have an fMRI which is a, a cat sort of thing, a bone, and you uh, this can be actually transported easily. This can be used for rehabilitation. Suppose a patient has uh, a hemiplegia or after accident has developed some uh, a problem, a weakness of his hand or something and a rehabilitation is going on. And you want to see how the hand is improving over, over a period of time. Whether your active intervention is making some change, some objective parameter, you can use near infrared spectroscopy. There you get the signals, the signals are very less. Then you have to amplify the signals and ultimately make a classifier based on the feature analysis and then tell that there is an improvement which is on So this sort of uh, work uh, which uh, we have started. Spectroscopy we had uh, done the, uh, some work and one of the uh, things that we did with triple IP Hyderabad and I was supposed to, there was Dr. Jawaharlal coming here. Uh, but in that center itself there is another uh, group. Professor Jayanti Shivaswami is there, uh, with whom we work to develop an Indian brain at least. Now, the main concept behind this was, you see this uh, brain, when we look at this, uh, today when I showed you this 
Alzheimer's disease cases or chronotypical dementia cases. You are taking this brain and comparing it with the brain of a Caucasian brain. <coughs> the evidence that is used is from US, meet uh, in uh, Canada, MNI template, Montreal Neurological Institute template. There could be differences. So actually China was to develop such a, a, a template and we saw, we saw that it is different from the Caucasians. So there is there has been a lot of interest in India also to develop such a this thing. So uh, we developed something, it's a small group, it is basically a normal young population at least. But that is not alone that we want. We want for pediatric as well as elderly population also. Now it just has to be made. Nimhas Bangalore is also doing some of our work on developing this uh, at least. Again, the computer science department, uh, Professor Jayanti works as a computer science department. We also work with industry. Uh, the two industries in which we commonly work with is G Healthcare as well as Siemens. And uh, this is uh, one of the work. Uh, you, you can see the pseudo CT. That is, this is a CT scan. This is the MRI HLB looking like a CT scan. This is called a pseudo CT. It's a technique called the zero T imaging. It's a particular sequence that we have run. And then you develop some post processing on that so that the images will look exactly like a CT scan. So from the MRI images, you try to get CT like images. Why do you want it? Because MRI has a problem when it comes to bones. Suppose there is an accident has happened and you the you are imaging that patient. Some of the fractures can be easily missed in an MRI. CT picks it up. Similarly, there is a tumor which is close to the bone. Then again, what is the destruction it is causing to the bones can be found out very well by means of CT scan. Here, this is the tumor which is causing destruction. MRI almost just a similar quality, but some of the features are not identified. So this is pseudo CT, again done by the GE engineers, and we have a collaboration with them. And uh, so, so we. we we are now working. Now, we, there, there, there was a PhD student from Kerala University who was interested in this work. But I think after the COVID, she has not uh, taken the same interest. So, I think papers have not come up from that way. Uh, similarly, with ASL, uh, multi-degree ASL, we are working with them, with the G. And the Siemens, we are working on synthetic MRI. What is synthetic MRI? I told, told about quantitative MRI. Synthetic CT, I told, told you with MRI. Synthetic MRI is another, another technique by which you just do one sequence. By doing one sequence, you can get T1, T2, flare, all these things you can get. And not only these are all maps also. If you put a point on these things, you will be able to get the T1 relaxation time, the T2 relaxation time. So you get a quantitative information. So synthetic MRI is a quantitative method and there is now this new technique which is coming in which is called MR fingerprinting. Just like your genetic fingerprinting and from the genetic fingerprinting you are able to tell about the individual the diseases the individual has. An MR fingerprinting has been brought up by the CMS and it is already in market now. Where if you do the brain, a normal brain will have each area having a particular T1 value, T2 value, all these values should be there. And when the disease comes, these values change. And what the, the software does is compare these normal T1 values with this, they call it dictionary, a normative data. And then say that what abnormality is there and what is this sort of abnormality. So just an area which is coming up and it could after some point of time be very important. The, I don't think at present in India any institution has a fingerprinting uh, software or the uh, method of uh, doing it. Synthetic MRI is of course there. We are having and we are working on synthetic MRI in multiple sclerosis situations. And we are also working on radiomics and radiogenomics. Now what is radiomics and radiogenomics? Now when you get a brain tumor, there are a lot inside the brain tumor there are a lot of features which are there. It is not just the features that are of the intensity and all these things, but many uh, features are there which I do not understand very much. But you, the skew deviation, for example, I don't know what really, really means. Is it? There are a lot of terms which you use, and all these terms come from the radiomics. Looking at all these features.
years now they are developing an algorithm by which you can tell this tumor is of this particular type and this tumor has a survival of this much. All these things can be predicted. This sort of a treatment is, should be given for this group of uh, tumors or based on radio waves. And there are softwares which are developing on radio waves. And what is genomics? Any tumor has the genetic part also by molecular profiling by pathology and today or tomorrow you are having a talk from a pathologist also I think. So you will be able to understand what is this molecular profiling in genomics. So if you com can combine this data of genomics as well as radiomics, it will be extremely useful. Only problem is this data are all huge data. That is very big data, your computers or high-end computers or our people. But radiomics and radio genomics we have already started giving to our residents, doctors. The problem with them is they do not know how to do it, anything. That is a problem. No? I, I was telling our main problem is we don't have engineers to support us in all these things. We are just doing something. Right? No, nobody will accept it. If we do that work, nobody will accept it. So we don't know what, what uh, we are uh, seeing is correct or not. So there is also some communication uh, problem. Uh, we have to sit more often together, then only we will be able to come up with these techniques, this monetary techniques. This is lazy genetics so, of uh, many genetic diseases today. Uh, the problem is every patient cannot go for genetic studies. It is costly. So can you image? Image is you are just getting an information by getting an MRI done, which is a much more simpler way. Anybody can get it done. So it's not a problem. So if you can if you get the information of genetics through imaging methods by overlaying the genetics and imaging, then again it will be useful for treatment of tumors and epilepsy. And this is one work I wanted to show. I had not given it. I, when I heard the travel there, I just wanted to show. Because I know Rahul is working a lot on the area of uh, uh, visualization of images. And uh, he would have definitely uh, told me about the HoloLens and how HoloLens is useful for surgical plan. Now, in our institute, uh, one of the other problems, and I don't know whether I have already told you this, anatomy teaching. Anatomy is the in first MBBS. The, one of the most important subjects is anatomy. And, and brain is solved by cutting it into slices and some dissection is done and then you are shown that this is ventricular. Everything looks very white. And you can just imagine an 18 year old boy or girl or a 19 year old boy or girl does not know what all these things is. In the first year of the dissection table you are shown all this. I did not know anything about anatomy but I passed. Anatomy. First MBBS I passed. Yeah. But I started learning it when I took radiology because there is no other way. If I had to report MRI brain, I had to learn uh, anatomy of the brain. It is at that time I started learning. It's the same situation for a surgeon also. I am very sure that most of the surgeons, after that anatomy finishes, the only thing he is happy that he has passed that examination. But he will not be knowing. You ask him uh, after a few days what is this. He will be again at 12th standard medical blah, 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 nothing more. <laughs> so that is the same. But now with this new techniques of virtual reality of teaching anatomy, things are going to be very good. Because you are actually going inside, you are not, uh, uh, cut, everything is not white and black. Uh, there are colors in it. You, you, there are several nuclei in the brain, body nuclei is one. There is another is uh, uh, the pitaman. Where do you identify? How do you identify? By means of virtual reality method, you can do it. The only difference between your technique and our technique is you have used the HoloLens method. HoloLens method for a small group it is very good. Suppose you are taking a class and you know today a MBBS class is 200 students in here. 150 to 200 students. You use the stereo vision. Two projectors. You use these two projectors and there is a special screen circuit. And then you do this. 3D visualization. It's a DST sponsored project which we are doing with Professor Jayanti Shivasom, the Flight Director of the Anatomy Department of Medical College Planning is also collaborating with us. So, uh, this is already actually, if you see, you know, uh, there is in Siemens uh, uh, software, there is something called cinematic rendering. 
the cinematic rendering they have used in Germany, there is a group which has used the same technique for visualization of the cinematic cinematic rendering. So it becomes much more easier for anatomy students to learn uh, the, the, this thing. Your technique is definitely good for small groups, but if anybody wearing a hour lens, it's almost quite difficult. Picture archival communication system is just for uh, information that. Uh, this is the way things are going to go. You know, electronic health records are going to come. Uh, digital, digital records. We have been using uh, digital archival communication system right from 2001. Uh, but still, in India, most of the public hospitals don't have that. So, suppose you go to a private medical college, they are not storing all their images, uh, transferring of images, and all is not happening. Our main medical college is private medical college and carrying medical college. Both the, I don't think, max is there. Pax is again an area where there is a huge lot of scope for improvement. A lot of work can be done for image uh, capture, storing it and sending it to various places for second opinion and all these things and uh, reconstruction methods in the interarchy and communication system. So basically last two slides I just wanted to tell you what are the main research areas that people can work on. The first one might not be of that much of interest to a computer science audience, that is on the hardware side, uh, and also to some extent software side also. Image, at the image acquisition, can you do something? Image acquisition means when you are getting the MRI images, the CT images, uh, or X-ray, or near infrared spectroscopy, or EEG, or any signal, can you work on the hardware side? For example, in MRI images, like developing a new radio frequency coil or a new sequence development in MR. You know the sequence development in MR, you can, can you imagine in India there are no places where sequence development in MR is done. With so many IITs that we have. Because why I am telling this, we are doing an Indian MRI project. The Indian government has asked us uh, as a part of in India, not us, the Ministry of Electronics and Communication to develop its own MR and a huge transfer of behavior. But we are not able to near, reach anywhere near it because sequence development, development is not happening here. So uh, that is the thing. Or in the CT, ultrasound, optical, imaging, cat lab, all these things, it is not on the hardware side. Image reconstruction time, the Dhatesh is already come, Dhatesh is from, so he has done a lot of work, he is coming to it. So he has done a lot of work on image reconstruction. Uh, techniques so you get uh, images whether this uh, for a very long time CT scan we were using filter back, back projection. Now after the iterative reconstruction techniques have come in the CT scan, I think it is a great story because pediatric patients who were getting radiation of about five to six grade, which is very bad. This which is children are very long and they are looking at. Now are getting many less less than one grade. So it's so such a good technique. The iterative reconstruction techniques are part. So your reconstruction techniques actually can play such a big role because patient safety also is improved. So that is so important. And then post-processing techniques where, as I was explaining, the rushing state of MRI, DDI, these are areas where a lot of work uh, can be done and a lot of contribution from engineers is expected. Machine learning, of course, you are having a lot of talks on that. But what we are doing, very simple research, what we are, clinicians alone can do, as doctors alone can do, is this, uh, the clinical trials. So you develop some tools, or Siemens develops a tool, or an engineering college develops a tool and gives us, we can do the clinical trials on, on a mutual a, a agreement, MOU being signed. So there is a need for collaboration. And this is what I was asked when we were, I met Babu uh, when he uh, uh, went to the railway station. The first question he asked, how do we collaborate? How do you start collaborating? You have seen that I have been able to collaborate with several institutions. Probably because I was in, uh, in the institute, city of institute. Now, when you uh, uh, undertake any project, and if it is a PhD work, you have to really go into the literature and find out whether it is clinically useful. How much of work has already been done in this area? How much data you can get? How many centers are ready to collaborate with you? All these things are important. Suppose you do a project uh, where 
you take a very rare disease and you are trying to work on that particular area, you might not get enough data. So you are ultimately whatever you are finally coming out with will be of no use. So look at that and then already some person when I go for talks like this in engineering college, so I want to do some work on body metric. If you see brain body metric, people have been started working on brain body right from 1995 96 you can see papers. So by now, these areas are not the areas that you should take. You should take more challenging. ASL, noise reduction in ASL, which I showed you, China is doing. That is a challenging area. Or QSL, which Joseph and his group is doing. That is a challenging area. Take newer areas where there are challenges. Less number of work has been done all over the world. Don't look at just the Indian literature. You should always look at the world everywhere, get good uh, papers and the work which has been done and then start. Your research question is very, very important. So, and it should be clinically useful. And at that point of time, if you start doing a collaboration, you the doctor, whether it is a radiologist or a cardiologist, whoever, they will tell you that, okay, this much work has been done and I don't think you should do or this is a good area to work with. So, it should be clinically useful. Avoid taking projects and methods which are already studied several times. I have already told you. Understand patient management. So this is what I was telling you. Many people start doing projects here without understanding the physics of capturing of an image. So suppose you are a good photographer, you should know how the camera works. Otherwise, you will be a good photographer. You may do some image processing on your uh, computer. You may get a good image. Enough. But if you can work, manipulate your camera well, your images, you may not need to do some of the image processing methods. At that level itself, you can solve the problem. You understand the physics well. Second is, as far as the disease is concerned, understand about the anatomy. If you are studying your brain, understand the anatomy of the brain very well. Some amount of functions in the brain and some information about the pathology of the disease that you are working on. Suppose you are working on perineural invasion, you should know about head and neck tumors, what are the tumors which spread through the nerves uh, and what are the areas, which are the areas which you have to uh, look for. This basic idea, even if you are working on pathology, you should be doing it. Otherwise, you will work on that area, but uh, it is a half-hearted work. It will, the full, you should know, understand the disease very well. Validation of process, and that is where the clinicians play a very important role. You are doing a particular work and this uh, Joseph and I, so we had meetings regularly previously when he had the PhD student. He tells me something, then I go to his institution or you know, he comes to my institution, we sit together and then look at the images and say that, okay, this image is good, this image is not good. That sort of a validation of results has to be done. So if you can, you have to, so that is why then you have to have collaborated from the clinical side. So the, this is one image I am always interested in uh, because this is the what imaging has what has happened in imaging over the years. So I, I am sure Joseph here would agree. I know Joseph and I are almost similar age. We studied the uh, Earth with these atlases, no? Joseph, you remember we at that time we never thought that we could use have a Google Google uh, no, no, no. What, what I'm talking is, most of us when we study school, in the school, we study about atlas of the brain, but we never thought that there would be a Google map which will show our university. Isn't it? We never thought about it. The same thing has happened in brain also. Brain, at the time that when I studied epigenes, we only talked about some atlas, some pathological atlas, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and all these things. Today, from that level, you are talking about cir circuits in the brain. Multiple, uh, you see, circuits, connectomes in the brain. Connectomes in the brain, circuits in the brain. From this level to this level, so it's a huge change which has happened. And I, I tell you, most of these changes have happened because of the collaboration between engineers and doctors. We, good collaboration, that is where we have not been able to do the way that. Western universities have been able to do. Our collaboration as far as in India is much less than if you see. Rahul will be a great thing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it is very comparatively less. And let this symposium be uh, thought, you should actually think of methods by which we can improve that. Institution, identify institutions where this collaboration is possible. 
and uh, may better than ever in of institution. If you are talking about that of brain tumor, and you collaborate with Sri Chitra alone, you won't get it much better. <coughs> you collaborate with Sri Chitra at a memorial in New Hans, or in the institute, or some other medical colleges who are interested, put a good uh, this thing in anyway, submit it for funding, there is chances of doing, uh, getting the fund and doing a better work is much more. You get a better data also. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, sir, for your enlightening session. Is there any questions?
Because one thing that you would hear when you go to the system is that the company from here is that they're not making enough conditions for investors in the And from you, you hear that there's not enough uh, engineers to apply where you live, right? Yeah. So it's, I don't know, it's a unique situation, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is true. What they are telling is true. Because uh, it all starts with the number of patients. Since the number of patients are more, the doctors are more busy, you and the doctors have no all this thing. There is no, uh, if I do for example research, so if a doctor does a research, what benefit I get? Nothing. So why should I do? It's the question. So you go to a, most of the, even the medical colleges in your medical schools I mean, in, the, uh, in India, except for main institutions where research is also important. Because I, I am working in that institution, there the importance to research here. Yeah. Journal institution, there is even if you do not publish anything, nobody is going to ask you anything. That's so that is, the, that is the thing. Nobody wants to do collaborations at all. And I think mean, that comes to what you said about having a social. Uh, that's very really important, right? All like minded people can be in one discussion, apply for multiple projects together, that would be very really useful. Uh, but one question related to what you said, uh, too. Uh, on the uh, Alzheimer's uh, study that we did when we saw the brain was shrinking, it was compared to Atlas, right? But have you done any study on uh, the same patient over time? Yeah. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. So such studies are quite less. We have not studied. Uh, we have only studied one time point afterwards. There are studies in literature which have done a huge longitudinal study over a period of time. The other problem in India is polar points. So suppose you have a patient with Alzheimer's disease coming to Sri Chitra District. Now if the person is from in and around the land, you should remember these are people who are already having neurodegenerative mostly 60 years plus people, they find it very difficult to be transported because they already have this disease and come. So, so they, they, the people who may come maybe in the next six months, you give a day, they come. One year they, they will not come. So even if you plan a longitudinal study for some two, three years, every six months you want an MRI to be done. It will be uh, the total number of patients that ultimately we get out of the maybe 50, maybe five, six or seven people. Rest may be coming from Kollam or maybe coming from Ernakulam or maybe coming from Kalyan all the way to Ramayana. They will not come at that age to pray, bringing them to uh, here in the city. So there, there are problems like that. It is not easy for a very long, large children studies. That is why in these studies there is a need for few centers joining together. And that is not happening. Longitudinal studies on dementia, if all the institute demands the Chitra, Vellur and some other institutions join together, then we will have a last time. But now we don't have such a time. Everyone has studied at one point, some few time points. One more question. Yeah, Ramesh. Yeah, okay, maybe I. Uh, the one more question is that. I know during your bachelor's time you were working already at that time with FSC and SEC uh, and MRI, right? So are you still using SEC in aging? No. Okay. Why not? Uh, first of all, SEC is not there in our institution. We have to send the patient outside. That is point number one. Secondly, SEC mainly our drug for neuro neurological diseases. Uh, epilepsy is one uh, disease where SEC has a role. Any director respect is called. At the time of seizure, you do, and either repeat two seizure points you do, and then you do a inter minus director and then uh, get the director. The problem is because you don't have a device spec and uh, to transport the patient and uh, all these things makes it takes a lot of time. We have stopped doing it, we did do only flex scan. So they went towards and PET CT at that point of time when you were working there was much less than that. Now PET is there in our campus, regional cancer center has a PET. And uh, outside the uh, private scan and PET center is also there. So we have a number of uh, uh, PET centers. So that's what respect is about. But I, there are still many centers which respect for epilepsy and many other diseases. 
discussions and all. So it is possible. No, so so one thing which I wanted to do, tell you and I was uh, talking to Bravo also, I was telling this. One of the most important thing is every radiologist, you know, there is a lot of importance to patient data protection. It has to go through two things. One is an MOU. Memorandum of understanding. So wherever you are working that institution, your boss, 
uh, who, with whom you are working should have a memorandum of understanding with their institution mainly on two things one is the patient confident confidentiality and the second point is that uh, this data sharing if it uh, publications come out of it should have uh, the, the this thing uh, an acknowledgement uh, as an author or something should also be given so those things has to be taken care of. So whenever you do collaborative project so that will come in the MOU. the second is the ethics committee clearance or the uh, um, review board uh, it is uh, every uh, hospital there is it has to it, when patient data is being used you know, ethics clearance has to be obtained this these two things have to be done so all the projects that we we i had shown if we, everything has gone whether it is with nit whether it is with iit or any institution has gone through the these two process mou and that is essential but with uh, rcc you can do rcc has a uh, team of radiologists who might be interested uh, sir yeah uh, thank you, first of all, for your recent uh, presentation at Open and WI area. Like, uh, I have one, uh, I mean, I want to take a suggestion from you, like, from where should we start reading the anatomy of brain? Like, could you give us some books? Yeah, so, anatomy of the brain, if you, uh, if you are doing an anatomy uh, brain-related project, first you start with, the, the most of the literature at present are available in the internet itself. And there are actually very simple textbooks. I can tell you one simple textbook is Inderbir Singh. It is called uh, written by an author in India, Inderbir Singh. Inderbir Singh. Uh, Singh, yeah. And it uh, gives a very uh, simple way of explaining. This is the book that is read by an MBBS students in the first year of anatomy. You can have an overview. You need not go into the depth in the way that an MBBS student goes. But you can get an overview of it. And then you have uh, uh, good articles in the internet also, which will also help you with. And I have a question, sir. Like, as you go to this uh, new world economics, mm. so some of the terms are going very fancy nowadays, like doping, also, surrounding now, and the hormones are very good. So, how if you start working on these domains, like new world economics and the uh, new world economics, okay. so how significant is this? You are telling if you are working on, these are actually hormones, it is not hormones, they are neurotransmitters. Between two neurons, how the communication happens is through these chemicals, dopamine, serotonin and all these things. So if you are working on those, those areas, uh, why do you want to work on those areas? Any particular question is there you have? Uh, not particular, I just wanted to know whether you are working in those areas, so how significant? They, they are very important. For example, all the Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's group of diseases, movement disorders they are called, are all because of abnormalities of these neurotransmitters. And there are many other conditions also in the brain. I told the very common condition Parkinson's, which is due to problem there. The issue here is uh, some of these neurotransmitters, as you, as you know, are chemical things which you may not be able to image presently. But there is this technique of positron emission tomography where you inject a radio ligand and that radio ligand goes and it has an affinity in the brain to some of these chemicals and those areas where there is an abnormality it will pick it up so there is a disease called parkinson's disease and there is another disease called parkinson's plus disease which is uh, uh, multi-system atrophy uh, names are there you would like to differentiate this it is possible with uh, this radionuclide studies, PET. PET scanning can do it. So what are the imaging studies if you ask, it is related to PET in uh, this thing. But more sort of studies, I think biotechnologies would be better to answer them. But imaging wise, what I told you is through using PET, you can uh, study these some of these neurotransmitters.
We kindly invite Dr. Kasi Adarashi, coordinator in part highlighting project Norway for the same. Yeah. 